No. Okay. No one has any questions. That's unfortunate. Well, uh, how no much voltage does the neon battery actually make if we're using three in series nine volt batteries? That, 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 it's not a neon battery, it's neon volt. It's not a neon volt. It requires like 250 volts or something. It's <laughs> It requires a lot. Uh, Wait, so you used the inductor to increase the voltage? Yes, okay. uh, just because we were abusing relays and switching them at super high speeds, which uh, switches the current from on and off inside of the coils of the relay itself at high speeds, and then that puts a really high voltage. Like, if you put your finger there, you can like pretty much pace yourself, I guess. Uh, but now for the main attraction here, schematic design continued. Uh, the reason it's called continued is because we're not done yet. Uh, if you guys remember, you don't have a microcontroller in your schematic yet. So we're going to primarily be talking about the microcontroller today. And at the end, there's going to be another little demo of how to read microcontroller data sheets because they are kind of scary. Bless you. Okay, so first off, this is going to be our last lecture for the quarter, and also the last lab for the quarter. Uh, after this, you should have, you should be able to be familiar with every single component that we're going to be using in our circuits. remainder of the circuits that we will be dealing with throughout the year. So basically, this is like the end of the circuitry, but you're still going to learn a lot more. But this is like theory. Okay. Uh, updates first is going to be the shared team goal is we want you guys to put your one bombs and two updated schematics. So I think we checked off almost everyone so far, just a couple left. And um, for the ones that we checked off, there are a lot of, some have a lot, some have a few updates, and then some are perfect. So if you're one of those teams with updates to do, just uh, add the schematics to your drives. But don't overwrite the old ones. Sometimes it's helpful to look back. So just name it B2 or B3 or whatever. <laughs> yes, also, we have already been asked a lot of questions about component, uh, like choosing components, and that's fine with us. So just keep asking questions. Really, we're both like very free. So if you message us any time, we'll be able to. The big one here is we don't want to teach you guys. So like with schematic design, Alexi had that whole demo afterwards. PCB design is a lot more complicated than schematic design. So we want to basically let someone else do the hard work. Dude, and I'm still going to do it. OK, Alexi might still want to do it. That's going to take like five hours. OK. PCB design is a lot more complicated than schematic. So IEEE Workshops is hosting a PCB design workshop. And we're just going to say it's basically mandatory. Like, well, like, if you don't go to it, your only other option is either listen to Alexi, which is you know pretty pretty yeah. average option, or uh, <laughs> search up tutorials by yourself. So I would highly recommend, basically mandatory. Okay, this or just search it up by yourself. And this is a lot easier because people will be there for you to ask questions. Then uh, they said it's going to be in person. I think when it should be, I, I checked and they said it would be next week Thursday, but there's no set time yet. And where it is, we have no idea. This is very or info will come. Yeah, we're, we're going to post a link. Yeah, they told us to plug this workshop, but they didn't tell us anything about it besides, yeah. oh, we're going to be PCBs. Yeah. So, I mean. Just go. Yeah. yeah. No, don't go. Come to, come to my. Oh, yeah. Let's see what this is. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry about this one, guys. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, okay. So, post check off some notes to add. Okay, right. First off, schematics and bombs. Once you're updated, uh, schematics and bombs are in the drive and notifies. Second, for this coming lab, uh, it's going to be a lot more. Well, actually, Alexi and I haven't talked about this yet, but we're going. We're very likely going to be implementing something called design reviews that are actual design reviews. So, basically, you're going to help us out with deciding what we need to look for in your circuits. Otherwise, we have to look through every single data sheet of every single component that you're looking for. But basically, you're going to help document. So this is all going to be written in the lab. It's at the very end section. So like with previous labs as well, at the very end, there's like, oh, what you should have done before checkoffs. And that's going to be there. So just make sure you look at that. Okay. Uh, oh, and a couple teams had this problem. But basically, what we want from you guys, schematic-wise, is every circuit organized in a way that a 
circuits here, circuits here, circuits here, and they're like spaced out a little bit so that's easy to look at. And also you can label it and they should all be on the same schematic file. So it shouldn't be like 15 different circuits and then you have to open them all. It just be they're all in one file. Okay, we'll talk more about design reviews later and you'll see it in the lab. Okay, an overview of today, we're just going to go over some communication protocols first. So that's going to be SPI, UR, I2C, and SOVD. Uh, you'll get to know all these later. Okay, <laughs> I can't start that. Uh, and then we'll have an overview of the MCU, oscillator, and recess switch circuits. And also a couple more. So this is the remainder of what we have to learn about. And uh, by the way, these communication protocols are for our sensors and also radio. And cool. And in that. Uh, do you think we're going to be stopping with communication protocols here? You're in for a surprise. When we say we're going to cover them, we don't really mean we're going to cover cover them. That's the end of winter quarter. This is more so the stuff you need to know in order for your PCB to work, not for your quad copter to work. Okay, uh, I can go first. Okay. Sure. So last time we went over the left five. This time we're going to go over the right five. We already said some a little bit of stuff about IMU radio. You might be kind of confused about what the pins do. That's what we're going to do today. And then we have MCU. And the MCU comes with the clock circuit and the recess switch. Those are kind of three and one, but we're going to have them separated, kind of, so it's easy to look at, and then finally program. So that's what we're going to do today. Interfaces. Okay, yeah, like Alexi said, we're going to talk a lot more like uh, on a bitwise level about how interfaces work, but for now, we're just going to tell you how much you need to know to finish your schematics, like what you need to know. That's really what we're going to do today. We're just going to overview of pins and then the functions of Uh, I guess I'll start off talking about SPI. Okay. Serial? Okay. SPI. This, okay, dude, Alexi added a bunch of like. It did it. Okay. I'm gonna do it. You need to know Motorola. Okay. I'm gonna talk about SPI now because. No, 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 hold on. I'll give, I'll give an overview and then he can talk about the questionable, uh, uh, not necessary information that are fun facts. That, that, that. Okay. SPI is a serial interface, it's one of the many that we have. And they, okay, it has multiple slaves, multiple masters, and full duplex communication. What that means is, well, first off, I can say full duplex. There's a term called full duplex and half duplex. Full duplex is basically you can communicate in both directions at the same time. So what both direction means is you can output information and input information at the same time. A multiple masters, multiple slaves. This is a serial interface that has this system of masters and slaves, which is basically what you're writing to and from. So in our case, our master will be the MCU, and then our slave will be the uh, radio. So we're writing to and from the radio. Are masters and slaves like yes. terms? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's the official terms. Yeah, People we're not are considering changing yeah. them, but due to the amount of legacy software and like the fact that it's so ingrained, like it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Like some of the pins are literally called master out, slave in, so, okay. you know. We'll see. Yeah, it's been here for a while, so we're not going to change that. I can go to the pins real quick. So these are the pins that you will have to take note of. There's a couple more, um, though I think we'll talk about those two actually. So basically, SPI, our radios are using SPI, that's the main thing that why we're teaching SPI. Okay. So SCK, actually this is repeated for multiple interfaces, but SCK stands for serial clock. This is just a clock, basically what a clock is, it's a signal that goes high and low at uh, some certain frequency that's predetermined, and that determines how fast your interface is going, and when, and, uh, when to basically do everything, like receive or output data. So everything happens on a rising edge or uh, falling edge of a clock. MOSI and MISO are the data lines. MOSI, as Alex said, is master out, slave in. MISO is master in, slave out. Uh, so you can kind of imagine what it means, like master out, slave in is like master outputting data and then the slave inputting data. And then the other way around for MISO. So as written here, writes data from master to the slave. And then writes data, uh, or reads data from the slaves and uh, these are common lines, so basically when, when we say there's mul there can be multiple slaves, for all say there's one MOSI line and one MISO line. And one clock. And, sorry, and one clock. So those are for sure. Okay, this last one here is specific to each. So basically chip select, uh, or CS, is uh, <clears throat> it's a pin that is dedicated to each slave there is. So for each additional say, you're going to have to have an additional chip select line, and that's basically telling which one is active at a certain time. 
you can see this in this diagram here. So SEK, Mosey, and Miso are shared, as in there's only one for these three slaves and this one master pair. Whereas there are three different chips left. So you can see here, as a zero, one, and two, that's basically saying slave one, slave, uh, slave zero, one, and two. Okay, this is kind of a review. Basically, the radio has all of these, and the way we're going to be connecting them is, first off, uh, the chip select will be connected to a GTO pin, except, as Alexei noted here, you don't want it to overlap with the programmer pins or I2C pins. Uh, I think he will demo this after, but reading the data sheet, it will tell you each pin's functionalities. It's kind of intimidating, but uh, it, it'll write out very, very clearly what functionalities each pin has. Okay. And then Mizo and Mosi, uh, okay, yeah, these just need to be connected to a pin that is labeled, literally they are labeled Mizo and Mosi. So you will see that. And then SDK, same exact thing, it will literally be labeled SDK. But it has to be SPI, okay. So basically, there are a bunch of SPI interfaces inside one uh, MCU chip. So we will have multiple options, just make sure that they are corresponding to the same one. So for instance, there will be something like SPI1 underscore Mosi, and then SPI2 underscore Mosi. If you choose SPI1 underscore Mosi, you have to do SPI1 underscore MISO, SPI1 underscore, uh, one underscore SK, and so on. So you can't mix and match. Uh, I'd also like to add, for the CS pin, there's going to be like specific like SPI1 underscore CS. Forget that, okay? You can use any pin you want for the CS as long as it doesn't interfere with the SWD pins or I2C. Uh, the reason for this is CS is just a GPIO pin that you either toggle high or low, so any pin can fulfill that role. And here's the additional note that I think Tim was referring to earlier. Our NRF radios have an additional pin called the chip enable pin. This should not be confused with the chip select pin. The function of the chip enable pin is to switch the radio from either receiving mode to transmitting mode. Uh, like Tim talked about uh, SPI having uh, full duplex communications, radios, in fact, the Wi-Fi on your computer, I'm pretty sure it's not capable of full, uh, full duplex communication. It can either send data or it can receive data. It cannot do both at the same time. So pretty much the chip enable pin is here to tell the radio whether it should be receiving data or transmitting data from other radios. Now, here is universal asynchronous receiver transceiver, or transmitter, sorry. Uh, if you've ever worked with Arduino, you should be familiar with this, because that's what the COM port is on the Windows computer, and I don't know what it's called on uh, Mac computers. Uh, but if you work with Arduino, some of this stuff should be familiar. So it enables communication between two devices. It's an extremely simple interface. As you can see, you just have common ground, transmit, receive, pair. That's it. Uh, there's, it's full duplex because it can transmit and receive at the same time. But there's no concept of master or slave in this interface. Each device is regarded as an equal, pretty much. Uh, now, the asynchronous part, what it means is that there's no clock signal. Uh, if you remember in SPI, Tim talked about SCK being the sort of like thing that governs how everything works. No such thing exists here. Rather, we have to match the clock on device one and device two so that they talk at the same speed, but there's no official synchronization between them. Uh, that is what, if you've ever worked with Arduino, you know, like on serial monitor, you can set the baud rate to be like 9,600 all the way up to uh, 115,200. Uh, baud, in this context, I'm fairly certain, just represents bit per second. So 9,600 be 9.6 kilobits per second, and well, the other one would be the same thing. Uh, this is going to be our primary debug method on the uh, quadcopter. The reason for this is because it's an extremely simple interface. It's very easy inside of QBYD to print to UART, so you can have error messages that are actual like descriptions of like function crashed here instead of relying on blinking some LED to figure out what is wrong. Very nice. Uh, I like going to be it. using, the, like literally, I think it's just serial dot print in C++. And then you can print any variable value you want. So you're going to be using that a lot. Well, no, it's not quite that simple. But yes. So. Uh, and this is just a bigger per, uh, picture of the other one. Transmit, transmit, receive, receive. It's simple. That's all I can say. You do need a common ground between devices. Because ground is the reference to which all of the signal voltages are measured. If there was no connection, there would be no communication because 
3.3 volts might be equivalent to like negative 2 volts over there. Having a common ground establishes a common reference between the two. And in fact, all communication interfaces, uh, except for like fiber optic ones or like radio waves, uh, all of the ones we're using require a common ground between devices uh, for this exact reason. Now, here's my favorite interface, okay? Inter-integrated circular, I squared C. And this time I'll actually read you the history. This was developed by Philips Semiconductor, which is nowadays NXP, I'm fairly certain, which is a company that develops microcontrollers. And pretty much, they developed an interface which uses just two wires for communicating with potentially up to 128 devices, which sounds a bit crazy. Uh, this interface, sort of like SPI, can have multiple slaves, multiple masters, but it's only half duplex communication, so it can only send or receive data, it can't do both. Now, I squared C is much simpler. It has two connections, SCL, which is the clock line. Uh, these different names than SCK, I'm not certain why. Uh, but it is the clock source for all the connected devices. And then you have SDA, this is the data line. Uh, you can either use it to receive or transmit data. It is also shared by all the connected devices. And because there's only one data line, you obviously can't send it in both directions. It'd be cool if you could, but you can. Uh, and like I said, maximum 128 devices. Now one thing that's missing here is the chip select line, right? Because with SPI, it was really easy to figure out how you select a chip. You drag one of the lines high, it's selected. You drag it low, it's no longer selected. With this thing, we're going to talk about this in winter quarter. The way you do it is you send an address on the data line of the device you want to talk to. The device acknowledges that it received the line, uh, it, uh, that it received the address. And then you've established communication until you send a stop command. Uh, for example, when you guys are doing your schematics, you might have noticed on the IMU there was a pin called AD0. Uh, this would have been the address pin. If you pulled it to ground, your address would have been OX68, I believe. If you pulled it high, it would have been OX69. That being said, on our breakout boards, it's by default pulled to ground unless you connect it high. So you don't need to connect it to anything for it to work correctly. And the internal address of your IMU will be OX68. Here you can see how it looks. Uh, you pretty much just have all the devices connected to the same two lines. Uh, over here, you can see two resistors connected to BCC. From what I hope you guys remember, this would be a pull-up resistor configuration. This is only really relevant when you begin to consider the stop, start, and acknowledge commands that the devices have to send to each other in order to figure out who's talking to who. That being said, we have internal pull-up resistors in our microcontroller. You don't care about having these external resistors. Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> That's all I'm saying, because fewer components means less of a hassle for you guys to put it on your schematic and less of a hassle for us to order stuff. Uh, but yeah, pretty much repeat. Like this device might have address OX15, this one's OX32, and this one's like OX68. If you want to talk to this one, you have to send OX15 across the data line. This one has to say, yeah, you're talking to me and then you establish communication. If you want to talk to another one, you have to say, I want to stop talking to you, I want to start talking to you, and that's how you communicate with all devices. That being said, we're only going to have one device, which is the IMU, and yeah, you don't need to worry about having multiple devices on the same line. Okay, uh, one note about, uh, this one, yeah. one note about this is that, as it says here, the chip select line, there is no chip select, right, as Alexi mentioned, and that's because the chip select is basically incorporated into the data line. So it's like, it's like incorporating both the output and input and chips alive and select all into one line of data. All right, so in our schematic, this slide, just like the SPI slide, pretty simple in my opinion. You need to choose an SCL pin. You need to choose an SDA pin. They need to both belong to the same I squared C interface. I squared C1, I squared C2, you can't mix and match, unfortunately. Uh, we only need two wires and uh, common ground, again, that comes back just as in New York. Now, oh, this is just reviewing what we're going to be physically doing with our bits. Okay, so radios and IMUs. So IMUs are using I squared C, which is the two line one, and the radios are using FPR, which is the most easy so one. And both are going to be powered with 2.3. I think we already said this during checkoffs, but some people were a bit confused because that was our bad reader really to that. But basically, BCC, so this is our IMU, the bottom one is our radio. That's what they look like. They're both breakout boards. So they're going to be lying on top of our boards, connected through just common headers. And the BCCs, both of these BCCs should be connected to your 3.3 signals, and the grounds are just a common ground. So um, 
inner I squared C, actually we'll, we'll say this in lab too, but basically our I squared C, you only need the top four, yeah, the top four pins here. That's SEO and SD, right? The clock and the data line, and then the power and then the ground. The other four are completely useless and either have internal pull-ups or you just don't need them. Okay. And the radio, you need, uh, I think all of them except for the interrupt request, so the I or Q, and we'll say that too. Okay, so, right, connections are documented in prior slides, as in we put in the previous slides, you can look back at those. The IMU stands for Inertial Measurement Unit as a general overview. This includes two sensors, this is the gyroscope and the accelerometer. Both of these help to determine which way our drone is oriented, so that's why we're going to be writing a reading from the sensor, it's going to tell us how we are tilting. And a radio will allow us to communicate with the drone, which is going to, one, help with bugging, but also help us control it, because we need to communicate, it, uh, communicate in a way that's wireless with the drone. Yeah, and I'd just like to quickly interject here. Uh, the, the reason we include this is because uh, the IMU is not necessarily uh, intuitive why we have it, but without it, imagine trying to balance without feeling which way is down. We want our quadcopter to be able to balance. If it doesn't know which direction is down and which way it's rotated, it's not going to be able to balance. Uh, and that's the reason for that. The reason we have radio is because we want to have a radio control quadcopter. So that's why we have a radio on it. Uh, th this is just like an intermission. Any questions so far? Uh, for the balance thing, so is it like self-orienting? Uh, that entirely depends on the software implementation. The IMU just gives you raw data. You actually have to write the code with, of which we wrote a little bit for you. Uh, which does the data processing in order to be able to figure out like, oh, which way is actually up. Uh, the, in real quadcopters, like, there are racing ones which don't have like auto leveling, but the majority of like toy ones and a lot of like the uh, enthusiast ones for like not hardcore quadcopters, uh, they do include auto leveling features just to make it easier for people to fly them. We have an auto leveling feature because we're both bad at uh, yeah, we're just bad at figuring out how to level it ourselves. So, yes, it, it, it can have that feature if you choose to implement it, and we're going to encourage you to do so. Uh, a little bit more specific, our IMUs will give us three values which will tell us what the orientation is in the X, Y, and Z uh, axis. No, no, actually that's a lie. It'll give us six values. Uh, then we'll have we'll to... We'll combine them into three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, any more questions? That's yes. Right. If not, I shall go on to the next slide. Okay, I, yeah, this one's serial wire debug. Now, this is one that you've probably never seen before, and if you're going into embedded systems, you're going to see a lot of in the future. Uh, this is not really a popular interface. Pretty much all it's for is for debugging ARM microcontrollers, specifically ARM microcontrollers. Uh, now, it, it has the way we're implementing it is there's going to be two wires, uh, SWCLK, guess what that one is, and SWDIO. Uh, so SWCLK is serial wire clock. As you might guess, it synchronizes all the data pretty much to a common reference. Then SWDIO is serial wire debug input output. Uh, much like I squared C, since we only have like one line, we can only send or receive data. We're primarily going to be using it exclusively to flash data to the microcontroller. Uh, I'm not sure how to read data from SWDIO. I never got it to work. There's a third pin you can include, which is just SWO, or serial wire output, which can only output data. That one works much better uh, than figuring out how to use this one for outputting data. Now, this thing was brought about pretty much by a desire to produce a simpler interface than JTAG. JTAG stands for Joint Test Action Group, I believe. Uh, it's a slightly more complicated interface, which you can also choose to implement. We don't have any JTAG debuggers, so it's completely useless to do so. Uh, but the SWD and JTAG are both interfaces which are used for debugging microcontrollers. We're using SWD because it's simpler for us to implement, and we actually have the programs for it. And Right here, you can see the SWD connector. So despite being only two signals, there are six pins. Uh, the reason for this is because the debugger wants to know the voltage at which your microcontroller is operating. 
it's going to be 3.3 for us. So this will be connected to 3.3 volts. Serial wire clock is going to be connected to serial wire clock on the microcontroller. Ground is going to be connected to ground, that's self-explanatory. SWG data input output is going to be connected to SWG input output. And NRST, this is the reset of the target microcontroller. The reason for this is it's not a signal pin, it's, I don't know, the best way I think it is, it's the reset pin, it's like the power button to your microcontroller. The reason you need this here is because you can only program a microcontroller if it is being reset. So we need this, it's not a signal pin, don't worry about it though. Uh, and then finally, SWO, I talked about serial wire output. You don't need to implement it, you can if you would like, uh, but it's not required, we're not gonna force you. And it will just provide you additional debug information and you can potentially use it as a replacement to UART, although we are gonna have to ask you to use UART just because it's much easier to use than SWD, especially when you have set it up in software. Now, in our schematic, like I already said, there's only one Oh no, I actually haven't said this yet. On our microcontroller, there's only one SWD interface. There's no like, oh, SPI1, SPI2. No, there's one SWD interface. You have zero choice in which pins it gets assigned to. Uh, in fact, it's quite annoying because some of the pin assignments aren't optimal. Uh, and I already talked about it. Serial wire clock to serial wire clock. Serial wire debug input output to serial wire debug input output. Connect and reset to and reset, connect ground to ground, connect VCC to VCC. I think that slide's pretty self explanatory. Do you want to read the issue? I want to, well, hold on. Yes. We can also come back to this. Okay, wait, uh, hold on. What, what, what is that for this? Okay, we're going to read the data sheet after this because this might take a while and uh, some of you might want to leave before. Well, this is like helpful for the last, but it's not like necessary because you can do it on your own. But yeah. But, you get to listen to me talk, so you know it's good. Microcontroller. So the microcontroller is the brains of our clock. It's going to be talking and receiving data from our sensors. And basically, it will execute all of the actual code that you're going to program. So read and process sensor data, and then it will also compute motor speed values. So this is basically doing all the logic part. Okay. It will combine both, OK, yeah, uh, digital analog interfaces and Okay, so this is the model we're using. This year we're going to be standardizing this one unit because everything is getting sold out and we bought these already. Yeah, so basically, yeah, it would be a pain if you try to order now because it's just, I don't even know. <laughs> you can order STM32 F zeros, which are super underpowered microcontrollers uh, for this application. You can maybe order a couple of F4s from China with like $30 shipping prices. <laughs> or, or you could use some like obscure microcontrollers, not really obscure, but ones that we've never used called the PIC series for microchip. Uh, no one uses those anymore, they're only supported by microchip. So this was our only choice. Uh, we're forcing you to use it because it's literally the only thing that's available. And it was the only thing that we could purchase. Uh, that being said, it's perfectly functional. I have worked with these in the past, this exact model. It has everything you need and more, actually, because it's a bit overkill, yeah. sort of, for what you're doing. I think for most of these, like, you can see how many pins they have. Just by that pure, like, sheer amount, you already know that. In your schematics, there's going to be a lot of, like, pins that you're letting hang because you're not actually going to use one of them. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, but this one's perfectly fine. And we actually have it, so that's another real reason. Okay, yeah, these are the main functions. So one, right, as we mentioned, communicate with radio and sensor. So receive sensor data and then communicate to radio. Uh, two, drive motors, compute. There's going to be a lot of computation stuff that's just going like sensor fusion stuff and also determining how you want to implement KIV and drive the motors. And then also storing data. So all this is done, you're just going to program it through SWDIO and then it'll be held within the uh, memory of the position. Oh, okay, okay. So, this is going to be like the main bulk of this lab. There's a bunch of subcircuits that come along with the MCU, and that's going to be what you're really going to be focusing on. So that's why we're going to have, you know, a demo of reading the data sheet because even though that sounds pretty simple, you just read through it. It's actually kind of tricky to figure out which ones you need and which ones you don't. So first off, there's going to be decoupling capacitors, as with any power source, and uh, that should be written in the lab, so you can look at it there. Uh, also written in the data sheet. Yes, that is true. Okay. I think there's like, oh wait, so we're going to have some requirements, and then the data sheet's going to have some requirements, and they might overlap, and you'll see how they overlap. But like, 
just make sure you read through. I think there's one big sample diagram of uh, like most of the power pins and how they're connected inside internally, and also what kind of passives you need outside. So look for that. Okay, yeah. Uh, external oscillator. That's basically. Uh, okay, we'll we'll go more in depth on to, into uh, I think all of these. But external oscillator is going to help us. So our MCU has an internal clock already, but it's kind of buggy. So basically, we want to improve that, and we will have an external oscillator to help uh, communication speeds. Yeah. Okay. So there's other passive elements along with the common capacitors that we will require. So you'll find those in the data sheet. And then. Oh uh, yeah, you're gonna. Okay. So these are all gonna be done through. Uh, tracing, so you're going to have communication lines to other modules, a radio and I view in specific, which are breakup force. Uh, yeah, okay, we already talked about this. Only use the pins that have those functionalities, again, in the pinout sheet. Right, something like this. That, I think that's the exact format of how I2C is going to be, by the way. So it would be like I2C and then a number 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, and then uh, SDA or SEO, and so on. And then we'll also have a reset switch, which we should have. Oh, okay. So this is something that we want to add. Basically, these, both of these are for debugging. So one is our LEDs. Uh, we did put this in the previous lecture, but this one we're going to talk about it, and uh, we're going to put it in the lab as well. Basically, you want to know if your battery is working. That's really simple, right? So simply, you connect an LED to, and these aren't like through-hole LEDs like you're, that you might be used to be working. These are SMD LEDs. They'll light up the same way, but basically, uh, you want to put them in series with the 1K resistor so they light up, and then you want to put them connected to one end to ground and then one end to 3.7 or 3.3, it doesn't really matter. That's just some power supply. Let's just say 3.2. Regulated outputs. Okay, sure. 3.3? So just connect it to 3.3 and ground. And then that will always light on whenever your battery is connected and you'll know that it's working. And then the second one, oh, the second one, uh, I have on my board because it's really useful for uh, like counting time. Like uh, I have it so that it flicks on and off and on and off. I think around four times before the actual motor starts spinning to give you like a leeway to get your hands out, you know, the splash zone. Okay. So basically, you're just going to connect that to a GTIO pin and then the other side to ground, same way, and then uh, one K one resistor series. And then we also have our UR debugging. That's just going to be TX and RS pin. So. Uh, I think in the lab we say it's going to be three pins. It's going to be TX, RX, and the ground. And you're just going to have those as headers, and then you will physically be connecting jumper wires to those. So that's not going to be done through PCB. It's just going to be headers, and then you're going to stab three uh, jumper wires into the headers and also into our nuclear, which is basically what we're using to program the ports so that we can communicate to our computers and we can go and we can see it. Clock circuits. So Tim talked about the internal oscillator. The internal oscillator is not particularly stable. You want a clock to be stable because all of the things that a chip does are based off of this internal reference. Uh, problem is if it's not particularly stable, you might run into issues where, like, let's say you want to communicate at 115,200 baud for UART. You're actually communicating at like 100,000. Due to the mismatch, it's very likely that you're not going to be able to communicate at all. So what we want you guys to do is to have an external crystal oscillator. Now there's two types of main families as with this one. There's ceramic resonators and crystal oscillators. We want crystal oscillators for the simple reason that they're actually much more stable than their ceramic counterparts. Now, MCUs, like I already said, already have an internal clock. They're garbage. Okay, they're usually at like 2.5% tolerance, maybe a bit better, maybe a bit lower. These can have like 0.1 or better tolerances, 0.1% for better tolerances. Now, uh, crystal oscillators require decoupling capacitors. What a concept. Uh, to filter noise as well as to establish resonance correctly. You're going to have to read data sheets for these. What a joy. Uh, resonators, like I already said, they're not as precise. They don't require external components. They're also generally smaller. They seem like they'd be really nice, but I'm going to have to ask you not to use them because they're not all that much better than the internal resonator. Now, you want to use a crystal that is compatible with the MCU. I believe that the range of inputs that the specific microcontroller we're using goes from 4 megahertz to 25 megahertz. That means you can't connect like a 48 megahertz crystal oscillator to the pins and expect it to work. You have to use the table of contents, read the data sheet, figure out what the actual range is, Make sure that it matches. 
Uh, you'll need to find the data sheet to know of the crystal oscillator, by the way, to know what the specific uh, capacitance and resistance values you need to use uh, for it. So if you didn't like reading data sheets, I'm sorry. Yeah, by the way, this is screenshot and straight out of the data sheet. So like uh, the MCU data sheet, not the oscillator data sheet. So this is an example of what you're going to be finding in there for this and also recess switch and so on. And this is for an eight megahertz, an eight megahertz resonator. Which is actually, I mean, we might want to standardize that later. Uh, we'll, we'll let you know about that. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. We can just set the internal clock scaling so everyone has the same. And then here's, here's a really difficult one, guys. It's a switch. What it does is it pulls the reset line low. Uh, this is, in fact, the same reset pin as the one on the uh, SWD header. When you push this, it pretty much kills all the active running processes, shuts down the microcontroller. When you let it go, it starts up running the program from the beginning, use it to reset stuff. Uh, that being said, we're using a mechanical switch. Mechanical switches are horrible in that they're really noisy. You can see over there what happens when you push a switch. It doesn't actually open and shut like a perfect like 90 degree line. Uh, there's this thing called debouncing where because it's mechanical, it might like contact the plates inside the switch, might contact each other, might create a whole bunch of noise. For this reason, we're going to have to ask you to put a decoupling capacitor. Wow, haven't heard that one in a while. Uh, in parallel with the switch, what the decoupling capacitor does is it counteracts the bouncing of the switch. That's literally what that noise in the middle there is called. It's called bouncing or fluctuations on this diagram, I suppose. Also, uh, these, this schematic, you will be recreating. But there are, I think there's an internal pull-up, so like you see to DCC. There. there should be an internal pull up to the NRSD reset pin on the MCU already. So again, you will have to check the data sheet. This is true, there is an internal pull up. So that's why there's a big sign that says this is not accurate. Now, here is what you would be considering if we hadn't picked the microcontroller for you. Number one, architecture. Now, there's a whole bunch of microcontrollers. You might be familiar with Arduino, for example. Arduino uses ARM's AVR uh, micro, uh, not ARM, sorry, uh, Atomos AVR microarchitecture. It's limited to 8 bits. It can be pretty fast, but generally speaking, it's more suited for low power applications like Arduino, for example. <laughs> there, are, another family might be PIC, which is the peripheral intern connect controller or something. It's manufactured by Microchip. Uh, I mentioned it before. It comes in 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits. It, it has a whole bunch of peripherals that you can use on it. However, only one company makes it. It's not perfect. Uh, all of these have different available support, price, speed, power consumption, and just about everything else. So if you want to pick one that fits your needs, in our case, the ARM microcontrollers fit our needs. They're plenty powerful. They're pretty cheap. We were able to buy them, unlike some of the other ones. Uh, and sort of, it's good for you to have on your resume because a lot of companies are using ARM microcontrollers in their products. Internet of Things probably uses ARM. Uh, actually, fun fact, the only company that I know that's currently using a PIC microcontroller are Jules, which use the PIC 8 microcontrollers because they have super low power consumption. But like all of the serious stuff more or less uses ARM. Uh, price, we don't want to spend too much money, right? You can buy stuff that's like $36 per microcontroller. It's going to probably be something that you absolutely don't need. In our case, I believe these came out to be about $7 per microcontroller. Like five to eight, right? Yeah, usually, but with shortages, prices have gone a bit higher. Availability, is it in stock? This is a big one that we've been stressing to a bunch of teams. Uh, speed, in our case, we're going to be doing some pretty intensive math. We have to calculate the quadcopter's orientation from raw data from the sensors. We have to update PID loops. We have to write new PWM values to all of the motors. And then we have to do that really fast, ideally more than 100 times per second. Realistically, when I timed it, it should be around 2,000 times per second. Uh, you can always lower the clock speed of a microcontroller. You can't really overclock microcontrollers. There are ways to do it, but that's not something you want to do. Uh, finally, interface, oh, not finally, actually, sorry. Uh, interfaces, we need SPI, I squared C, UART, and SWD. Not all microcontrollers have these interfaces. Some have more, some have fewer. We want to have these. Uh, so naturally, you would pick one that has these. Uh, highly support, this one is probably the most important one, in my opinion. If you buy a microcontroller, 
and you can't find help for how to use it, you're going to hate your life. Okay? Uh, STM32 is really good in this regard. They have free libraries, free IDE, free user forums, uh, really cheap development boards. It makes it much easier to develop for their platform uh, simply because you can buy the hardware, you can play around with the hardware, they don't charge exorbitant fees and there's no, nothing is really hidden from you. You can go online, you can watch their tutorials, everything, compared to a company like, I don't know, let's say, uh, what's a company I don't like? Uh, microchips at SAM series of ARM microcontrollers. Zero support, the IT is a bit buggy and it's kind of a piece of garbage. Development boards are really expensive, they're like 100 bucks at least. Library support is decent, IDE garbage. Uh, I tried using it over the summer, never again. Like, left a horrible taste in my mouth. Now, in this case, this is just talking about why we pick towers. It's not really relevant, we picked it. It fulfills all of these. And it's well documented. Yeah, it's well documented. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, documented. Questions so far? Actually, we might not have any Oh, uh, this is pretty much the end of it. Yeah, no, so we were going to go to the MMC data sheet, but I want to... Wait, no, no. Okay, yeah, yeah. A couple things after. What do you mean? Logistics uh, after, but like... Okay. I think that's the end of the group. Uh, the end of the... Official end of the lecture, but you guys better stay out for the MMC data sheet. Okay, it's like 250 pages long. Okay, and there are a lot of sections. Okay, any, any questions? No. Okay, so we're going to go to Okay, yeah, I, I think we're just going to start doing this every lecture, so that it's very easy to find. I'm going to start with the things that, like, uh, if you don't know what you need to do, this is what you need to do. Okay. So first off, it was update team drive folders for the previous lab. So by the end of this coming lab, you should have a finished schematic and a finished bomb. And that's all we're required. And then, when and we're going to move on to PCB. So, finished schematic, finished bombs. If you didn't do your deposits and lab safety trainings, we have a, okay, actually, to be fair, we haven't looked at lab safety trainings yet. We've looked at deposits. Actually, we kind of got roasted by that. Okay, whatever. Uh, we, uh, we have a couple people who haven't done deposits yet. I don't know if any of you guys haven't, but uh, we'll be reaching out very soon. Okay. <laughs> but almost everyone did, so that's good. Okay, and the lab safety training, yeah, we have no idea what we're going to do. Okay, so lab three, we are combining last lab and this lab to be very, very clear. You should, I think a good strategy is to first off, make the updates to your previous lab and let us know so we can look at it. And then add on to that. So basically, hopefully, the goal is, I don't know if you guys have multiple people and it's kind of hard to like find, it's not like Google Docs where you can uh, automatically update stuff. But basically, hopefully you can have one schematic and then just add stuff to that. So you don't make it like two separate ones and copy paste, although that works too. But um, yeah, basically you're gonna combine this one with the last one and you will have one general schematic with everything in it. And I found it really helpful to separate circuits. Like you can box them or you can label them names, like, oh, this is the motor, this is the ion and radio, and so on, and then separate them, so that's easier to look at. So the main ones we're looking at are the MCU and passive. So LEDs, more pins. We have the radio and RMU, which you basically already did, except we're going to be actually connecting those labels that you have hanging right now to MCU, uh, to MCU pins. You have your program pins with the SWD, your oscillator and reset uh, switch, which are both like kind of basically very connected or interconnected with the MCU pins. So, but you can still separate them if you want to. This one, yeah. And then finally, design review, which will be documented on the actual app to let you know what you need to do for that. For bombs, you can take your PMOS circuit parts out. If you don't, by the end of, I don't know, however long, we'll take them out for you. But basically, that was just a training exercise just to find parts. And you guys all did fine. So, you can take those parts out. And then, oh yes, okay, I wanted to add this because some people didn't know. But at the left side of like, okay, you open up Eagle and have a schematic on the right, and there's like a bunch of tools on the left and a bunch of weird stuff on the left. There is somewhere, and it will be very obvious to you, where there's a list of parts that you're using inside your schematic. It will literally be listed out. R1, R2, R3, like for resistor 1, resistor 2, resistor 3. Those are all the values. Basically, every single part there should be accounted for in your bomb, unless otherwise, like, like we will give you your motor JSTs, but like you will not need to buy the actual battery. Right? Like those oh, ones to buy anything because we're buying it for you. Yeah, you won't need to buy anything, true. <laughs> but make sure it's documented. So everything, look through that, double check, look through that. Okay. Working from internally just means don't do everything at one time and update your bomb as you go. Because that's kind of helpful. 
And then basically design workshop next to it. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the MC data sheet. This is what I've been waiting for all night. Uh, right, so I'm going to have to type this with my display settings as well. As you can see, I have a lot of tabs open. But uh, over here on the overview, you can just, uh, the first page just gives you a few things. Uh, it tells you, oh, we can give it an operating voltage from 1.7 to 3.6 volts. We're going to feed it constant 3.3. You can see, oh, it has two analog digital converters. It's 170 megahertz. Oh, actually, it says the crystal oscillator megahertz yeah. picture. Oh, 4048. I lied when I said it was capped out at 24. Uh, let's see what else it says here. It talks about timers. We're going to use timers for PWM, clock management, low power modes, a whole bunch of cool stuff, which is mostly useless for us, uh, except for uh, it talks about I squared C somewhere. Oh, it talks about it on the next page, right? So <coughs> it has three SPIs, four UARTs, three I squared Cs. Those are the ones we really care about. It also has like USB, USB 2.0, CAN. CAN is controller area network. If you ever go into working with cars, you'll learn all about it and how to learn to hate it. So, what? This is 300 something pages. 201 pages. 201 pages. So the table of contents, surprisingly, is actually important to read here. You can, you can probably tell what you don't need to read. We don't care about memory protection unit. That's not something. And VFN 32 LQFP all the way up to like 100 LQFP. We're using LQFP 48. LQFP stands for Linear Quad Flat Pack, I believe. Uh, quad just uh, is that on four sides you have pins. Flat is that it's flat. Pack stands for package. Uh, linear is that it in a square, I suppose. I don't know why they have to specify linear. So if you want to see pin PA5, we go look at LQFP48. We scroll down. Forever. You can also command that P. Yeah. That's a quicker way to do it, honestly. Right here, pin PA5, we control that pin. We can see the, uh, so pin name function after reset is gonna be PA5. Here are the functions that PA5 supports. Timer two, channel one, SPI1, SCK. Hey, that's something that we might be interested in. UCPD1 underscore FRSPX, no clue what that is. Uh, it also has additional functions. ADC stands for analog digital converter. Remember the voltage divider you guys made in the previous schematic? It needs to be connected to a pin that can support analog to digital conversion. That's actually something we didn't talk about in our presentation. But this is how you would find uh, pins. That being said, the much easier way to do it is like, let's say you want to have an SPI interface. You control F SPI1 underscore. Now, the first thing we have here is SPI1 underscore NSSS or NSF. That is the slave select pin. Like I said, we can just use a regular GPIO. Next, next time we hit enter, we have SPI1 underscore SDK. We look at it, PA5. On our schematic, we can connect SPI1 underscore SDK to PA5. We hit enter again to go to the next definition. Oh look, SPI1 underscore MISA, that's pin PA6. So you would just go like this through the data sheet, pretty much control Fing the whole way through until you find the interfaces that you're looking for. You can do the same thing for I squared C. Sorry, on uh, I squared C1. I squared C1 underscore STL could be pin PA13, for example. Now, when you go to actually design your PCB, you might want to shuffle some of these around in order to create the most optimal uh, positioning. But generally speaking, uh, this is a great way to uh, find what you're looking for. Now, here's the thing. This is one I squared one underscore STL pin. It's not the only under, uh, I squared C1 underscore STL pin. Even though these belong to the in same interface, there are multiple pins that you can map them to. Uh, this actually gets pretty useful because sometimes they swap positions, which makes routing easier. This will probably make a lot more sense when you're suffering from PCB design. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can pick the specific pin that you want the that you want the interface connected to, uh, and usually they have multiple options. Now, uh, the ones that I really want to talk about are SWD. Uh, right here, you see 
SWDIO. This is the only SWDIO pin. It's going to be pin PA13. That means you can't use this pin for I squared C1 underscore STL. You can't use it for any of these other functions. We're going to force you to stick to SWDIO. Uh, the next pin over here, you can actually see it's uh, SW clock. We're going to force you to use this one as well. Uh, so these can't be used for any other function. PA13 and PA14. Keep that in mind. Uh, other stuff, other stuff. Electrical characteristics. This is an interesting one. Oh, wait, but you want to go to PWM. Oh, yes, PWM. Uh, for PWM, uh, that's how we're going to control the motors, right? The speed of the motors. So in order to control it, what we need is we need to use timers. Now, what timers are is sort of an internal uh, clock, essentially. It counts up. Once it hits a certain value, it changes whether a pin is low or high, uh, which is what generates the PWM signal. For example, if you have uh, like a five hertz clock and you count up to five, every second you're either going to go low or high uh, on your PWM signal. So that's pretty much what timer pins do. We're going to talk more about them when you have to actually program them. Wait, actually I have one. You see here it says timer 16 channel one, and here it says timer 16 channel one end. So the end just stands for inverted, and I actually ran into that problem. It actually doesn't provide a problem, but you just have to edit a little bit of code. Uh, but just to make your life easier, avoid the end pins. Like it says timer 16 underscore one end. There's always one that's not inverted, so just use the other one. Right, so pretty much for PWM, what you're looking for is PIM pin, PIM pin, top one. Uh, and you just want to have four different pins, one for each motor. Like uh, Tim said, you might want to avoid the end channels. Generally speaking, what I'd recommend is to pick them from the same family. Like if you're going to pick Tim 1 for one of your motors, pick Tim 1 for all of your motors. Uh, the reason for this is that different PWM pins have different uh, values that they can count up to. Most of these can count up to like 63,000. Some of them can count up to like 1.2 million or something. And it might get a bit hairy when you have to actually uh, make sure that the PWM signal is the same on all of them. So I just recommend sticking to the same family of PWM pins. Uh, but pretty much right here, the thing you should learn is Control F is your friend for this sort of stuff. Uh, however, uh, it's literally your friend for all this stuff. Uh, hold on. Oh, that's the. Uh, so this is our power supply scheme uh, in section 5.1.6. It tells you how many decoupling capacitors you need to have. So it says n times 100 nanofarad plus 1 times 4.7 microfarad between VDD and VSS. What this means is depending on the number of VDD pins, you would have n many 100 nanofarads and then one 4.7 microfarad. Then it also has an additional section like for what do you do for your VDDA pins? What do you do for VREF plus and VREF minus? Your microcontroller, I'm pretty sure, doesn't have either of these pins, so you don't need to worry about it. What about the VBAS pin? It literally tells you everything that you need to do in order to have a functioning microcontroller here. Our lab should also have I this think information. we repeat the same exact information for the 100 nanofarads and the one for my 4.7 microfarads. Oh wait, okay. Uh, I think, if I might be mistaken, but I think we have four VDD DSS pairs. So that just means like, there's a VDD DSS one, and they're like next to each other, or they might be a bit, a little bit far, farther apart, but they're like, there's four of those pairs placed around. For each of these pairs, you want one 100 nanofarad capacitor in parallel with those. And then, as a general decoupling capacitor, you want one 4.7 microfarad. So you need, if there's four VDD DSS pins, then you need four 100 nanofarad sensors. Or 100 nanofarad sensors. Yeah, what Tim said. Uh, that being said, the two main sections of the data sheet that you're going to be interested in are this one, uh, because this one tells you all the decoupling capacitors. The pin definitions one, which if you scroll down a little, uh, it talks about all the definitions of the pin, but you're primarily going to be just control asking this one, or oh, which pin corresponds to like I squared C1. Uh, the other stuff that you might want to be interested in is uh, NRST. We talked about the signal. You just control F and then enter your way through here. And oh, look, hold on. Here it said bidirectional reset pin with embedded weak pull-up resistor. Like Tim said, this pin does have a pull-up resistor. And, oh, check it out. It tells you which pin is the reset pin. 
that's how you know. Uh, other pins we talked about, we didn't really talk about any of the other pins. These are just all the interface that you need. That being said, oh, there is one for the oscillator. Uh, uh, the oscillator pins are clearly marked on oh, here we go. Well, the okay. schematic symbol I sent though. Uh, okay, just to mention, HSDL, wait, do you want to talk about HSDL and this whole method? This will actually give you the exact typical application of uh, HSD stands for high speed external oscillator, so that's what we're using. Right, that being said, this is not necessarily true. Uh, you're going to want to look at your crystal uh, data sheet. This is just a generic part. Uh, as you can see, the capacitors don't actually have a value. In order to find the value, you have to look at your specific crystal data sheet uh, to find that stuff. But yes, it does uh, tell you what it's supposed to look like somewhat. Uh, other stuff in here, other good stuff. Uh, yeah, but I'm just gonna you know, enter this way. It, generally speaking, if you wanna find something, you control F it and uh, it should pop up eventually after you hit enough time. Uh, this case, I'm looking here. So right here, yes. So this is going to be the circuit for your reset pin. It just does 0.1 microfarads in parallel with the reset button. So uh, you don't really care about what's going on internally, but you can see that there's a pull-up resistor, there's a double integral sign, and a filter inside your microcontroller that does some magic to make sure that it actually resets. Uh, Everything inside the box, you'll see that a lot, is internal within the microcontroller. Yep. Uh, over here you can see that uh, what the minimum is in order to reset it. You probably don't care about this stuff, uh, but if you are interested in reading data sheets, uh, <laughs> this should be fun for you. Uh, other stuff, actually interesting stuff, is if we go to the I squared C parameters, I believe. Uh, oh, which section is this? Oh, there's also volume. So those are the main uh, functions that you are main pages in the data sheet that you want to see. But I think there's one more for the boot zero pin. Uh, oh, yeah, near the end. So boot zero is an important pin. Thank you for reminding me about it. So uh, we don't care about boot one. We just don't. What boot zero does is it dictates where the microcontroller is going to boot from. Is it going to boot from user flash or is it going to boot from system memory? You're going to have to read the data sheet for your microcontroller. This is the one that they used last year. So what you might read here is not necessarily relevant to what's in the one for yours. Uh, as you might have noticed, I did the same thing last time with the TCS6301. Uh, pretty much here, I believe in this microcontroller, you want it pulled to ground through a 10K uh, resistor. It should show up. It should be a sample. Of, I mean, I love six. No, it doesn't have any pictures, but if we Google boot zero. Wait, okay. I definitely remember for the F411. No, that is that is the one from the F411. So no, there was 100% of the schematic where it was like, that would show. You'll have to look for it. It should be near the end, and then just scroll through the pages. Yeah, I think it was the same. Uh, right here, boot zero in this case seems to be pulled high for this specific one. But generally speaking, if you Google something, STM32, fantastic community surrounding it, you're probably going to find something. Uh, we're going to actually mention this in the lab, I believe, about that. Uh, other stuff. Uh, you might read some sections like voltage regulator and be like, oh, why do Lexi make us include a voltage regulator on ours? Uh, the reason for this is that it actually talks about what you can expect uh, from the different input voltages in, oh boy. Uh, it doesn't specify which table, but there's a table that says it. At 3.3 volts, you're going to be able to run it at max speed. If it's below 3.3 volts, it's going to be 150. If you run it at 1.8 volts, it's only going to be 26 megahertz, which is a bit too slow for what you want to do. But pretty much this, if you're interested in learning more about the microcontroller, you can just read this for fun. We're not going to force you to do it. Primarily, we're going to teach you how to use control F to find the things you want. Uh, however, there's a lot of interesting stuff hidden away. What? I'm trying to find. There, there, I swear I'm not trolling. There should be a boot zero. I'm like, 
the one pick from Toy Story where he's like standing oh, on the TV. Over. Yeah, there's none. There should be someone. It's just one resistor, but yeah. You should find it just to go through. Maybe it's not available to you. Yeah, it, it's not. I think everything I lecture showed today is pretty much all that you need to go through. Yeah, but uh, just, just to repeat, if you're picking these yourself, you would have to look through this section, like, oh, it supports i squared c, oh, it supports u hard, oh, it supports SPI. That being said, due to the shortage, you can't afford this luxury because, hold on, I'm literally going to show you what's in stock right now. Okay, we type in SPM32. Also, this is mainly likely, but he went through like, I think I have four different versions of microcontrollers, and then they just kept running out of stock before we could order them. So the stuff that's in stock, hold on, we don't want to develop this board. Uh, we want uh, microcontrollers. Yeah, the 30 uh, ARM microcontrollers. There's 98 in stock. Uh, of the ones that are in stock, the W series is wireless. The G0 series is extremely weak. So we're going to get rid of those. Uh, in fact, we can filter through the series. We have the F401, which is reasonably fast. F410. Uh, the F7 is a bit too expensive for what we need. And literally nothing else is relevant. The L series is low power. They're incredibly expensive, but they are low power. We apply these filters, we have four results to make. Wow, what a joy to solder. Also, there's only 45 in stock. We're not going to be able to use these. This one is in stock. There's 24 in stock, in fact. It's $11.70 per microcontroller. We can't buy this. This is too expensive. It was literally impossible to find the microcontroller that we did, but we still did it. And yeah, <laughs> that's just the dire situation of my controls right now. And sorry, I got a bit off topic towards the end there. Uh, that being said, I do have a question. Do you guys have any questions? No questions? Okay. Well, in that case, unless someone has a question, I don't think there's much else to uh, cover in this thing. The, uh, the specific stuff you're going to need to do is going to be in the lab. We have that done. So yeah, as soon as the video is finished uploading, I hope, which who knows how that will be. Uh, but primary takeaway here is that big scary data sheet use control F, and the data sheet is no longer so scary. Because you know what you're looking for. We tell you what to look for. You just need to find it. Thank you. You're welcome. Done. Okay. Yeah.